Oh, hi. I didn't hear you come in. I'm Mike Flanagan. And I'm here to ask for your help to make my latest film, Absentia, a reality. And while editing feature films, shorts, documentaries, reality television, and advertisements over the last 10 years, I have learned and honed the subtle methods of this visual medium. So I'm here to beg you, each one of you, to go to kickstarter.com and pledge at least $5 to help make Absentia a reality. You can help us make what will be, one way or another, my last independent feature film. Do you want to know how one man went from begging for money on the internet in a goofy fashion to becoming one of the most famous horror directors in the world? Then stick around, baby, because today I'm diving into the world of Mike Flanagan. We'll start off with his early life and education and then segue into his amateur work. Then we'll cover his career in features before closing out with his career in TV. Finally, after we get through the deep dive, I will rank all of his work, including all his limited series. So if that sounds interesting to you, grab a drink and grab a snack. I'll be right here waiting for you. Before I jump jump right in though, I do have another offer for you. I make all of this banging, super entertaining horror content for you for free. In exchange, you sacrifice your soul to me. I know, it sounds crazy. Hear me out. All you have to do is click the subscribe button and that automatically makes you a member of the cult of Haunted Hippie. Maybe you're like, mm, I don't know, I think cults are bad. If I had bad intentions, would I tell you that it was a cult, huh? I'm not Jared Leto. And I'm also not a top one percenter in a multi-level marketing company, so you you can trust me. It also helps if you click the like button and the notification bell, that way you never miss out on our next meeting. Maybe you're not convinced, but stick around. I think I'll get you uh, on, on my side. All right, you Mike Flanagan fools, you ready for this deep dive? Let's jump in. Mike Flanagan was born May 20th, 1978, which means that he just celebrated his 45th birthday just a few days ago. If I were a better YouTuber, this video would have come out on his birthday, but nonetheless, happy belated, Mike. Because his father was in the US Coast Guard, his family moved around a lot during his early life. Starting in Salem, Massachusetts, what better place for a horror director to be born? I guess the fact that I was born in Salem kind of pre-programmed me to be a horror fan. There's something in the air there. I was only there very briefly, but I was born there and fascinated as a kid with the Salem witch trials, even though I was only actually in Salem for one year. I was still just a little peanut when they moved me out of there, and then we moved all over the place when I was a kid. We did a number of years on Governor's Island in New York, which was also a really gothic place. It had a lot of abandoned and renovated jails, and my apartment was in an old Civil War fort. As a 10-year-old, you go around the island with other kids and tell ghost stories to freak each other out. That was a great place to develop the appreciation of a well-told ghost story. Also, as a mere fifth grader, he was introduced to a little-known book called Stephen King's It. He claims this was a trauma traumatizing experience, however, it did get him hooked on Stephen King as an author, and subsequently horror in general. In fact, the first film he ever made was also around that time, and it was an adaptation of It that was around 22 minutes long that he made with his friends. I wish that still existed. Maybe it does, but definitely not on the internet. His early family life also influenced a ton of his work. As you could probably tell, there are familial themes littered throughout his catalog. I actually had a relatively uneventful and safe childhood. I always viewed home as safe. And I know that isn't everyone's experience. And I think that's some of the horror of the world. The idea for me growing up that something could infiltrate home was something that was unthinkable. In his works like Oculus, Haunting of Hill House, Bly Manor, all of that really comes through. But it's interesting because he says that his family was very nuclear. He had a really big extended family, but he never really knew them. So his family didn't necessarily mirror the cranes, let's say, from Hill House. But a lot of the subject matter explored with them was very personal nonetheless. His family and Stephen King were probably the greatest muses of his career, but he read from a lot of the other horror greats as well. That is until high school when his family moved to Maryland and he finally started getting into cinema. I would always read the King books and I got into H.P. Lovecraft and things like that, but high school is when I started getting into movies more and really studying them. I made it a rule to power through as much horror cinema as I could because as a kid I couldn't watch that much horror, it freaked me out too much. Embarrassing movies too, like Killer Clowns from Outer Space, I couldn't finish that one. I was hiding behind the couch and having nightmares for months. Also in Maryland, he attended Townsend University where he got a BA in electronic media and film and a minor in theater. He made three films in college, the first being a movie called Make Believe. I wasn't patient enough to wait for the curriculum to allow me to make a movie. You wait for three years until your senior year when you'd make something as part of a team on a 20 minute 60 millimeter short. But I couldn't wait. My sophomore year, a mini DV had just shown up on the market and people were going off and making these little mini DVD features. So I rounded up a bunch of people, scraped together
together a little bit of money and made my first feature, which was called Make Believe. It was all about sophomore college dating angst, which at the time I thought I had so much to say about. I thought I had so much to say about love and I didn't at all. Unfortunately, I don't have access to any of the movies that he made in college. As far as I know, they might only exist on DVD. I guess that's how they distributed them back in the day when he was in school. So those films unfortunately won't be included in my ranking today. He claims that his first three movies in school, so Make Believe, Still Life, and Ghosts of Hamilton Street were not fit for public consumption, but they were valuable learning experiences nonetheless. So maybe that's why they're nowhere to be found on the internet. Unless you know where they are, then please enlighten me. Like he said, they were very melodramatic. He thought that that was sort of his calling, but then he realized there was no market for them. Not finding any filmmaking opportunities, he then became a freelance editor in the early 2000s. So around that time, you might have seen some car commercials edited by a one Mike Flanagan. He also has editing credits on Your Place or Mine, Bone Detectives, Million Dollar Listings, and many more, including most of his films and TV shows. But after becoming frustrated with the lack of momentum in his career and being stuck in a town with a million other wannabes, LA, he realized he needed to make a change. This is uh, kind of new for the festival. That's what they told us, that we're the first horror film accepted into the fest. We're psyched yeah. to be here, we're ecstatic. In film school, you're shown a lot of really groundbreaking, avant-garde cinema, and Flanagan has spoken about how that kind of trapped him, only in the sense that he set too high of expectations for his own work and getting his own voice out there. At a certain point, he went, oh, I'm wasting a lot of time, and so he decided to pivot to horror and just get out there and make something. Because he had always been a consumer and fan of the genre, but it just never occurred to him to make a horror movie. Oculus Chapter 3, The Man with the Plan, was then the short film that he decided to make. You're Years ago, Tim Russell's father committed a horrible atrocity. It was always Tim's contention that the large ornate mirror in his father's possession was the cause of this terrible event. Tim has traced the bloody trail of destruction that treads in the wake of this dark and forbidding mirror. With a history of over 300 years of mysterious circumstance, Tim intends to capture these horrors on tape and reveal the true nature of evil that lies within. As you could maybe tell by the clips, this horror short takes place entirely in one room. That was the challenge that Mike Flanagan decided to create for himself. How can we shoot this all in one room and with bright lighting? It was only shot for $1,600 in an artist studio that was in the back of a coffee shop. Fun fact, that is the exact amount of money we raised last year for my short film Somnum. Mike says they had to stop shooting every single time that they would make a cappuccino in the store, and also during the busy hours they could hear all the customers' orders, and that the temperature inside that artist studio was about 110 degrees. Also, apparently the sound design of the film took longer than any other part of the production. This short also got him some positive attention, far outperforming any of his other work. It won Best Horror Short at the Tabloid Witch Awards in 2006, and he's quoted several times in this article talking about the film. We'll have more video interviews once we get into the more popular years of his career, but at this point in his life, he's not exactly doing press junkets, you know? But here he's quoted about sort of like the inception of the movie. I was disheartened that many modern horror trends lean more towards gross-out comedies than real horror. Once drunk at a party, I said to co-writer Jeff Seedman that a competent director can make a truly frightening film without any genre requirements that Hollywood is leaning on these days, and setting the film in a bright, sterile environment rather than in the overused and overstylized darkness and shadows, we got to talking about it, and once we hit the one guy alone in a bright room idea, we got real excited trying to make it scary. The original plan for this short was actually to shoot eight more anthological stories, this being the third, and the first three short films were to be combined into a feature film, or so he said at the time of this festival. Why they went out of order and started with chapter three, I don't know, but we know from a lot of Mike Flanagan's work that he loves a non-linear story. He goes crazy for it. You can see so much of what the feature length Oculus would become from this short. I thought about breaking it down because it is really fascinating how much of it actually remained the same, but I am going to be avoiding spoilers for all of his work in this video. Especially because I think the short is actually worth watching. Despite the success of this short film, Mike Flanagan would take meetings and they would go, well, we'll take it off of your hands because you've never directed a feature. So he was like, fuck off, I'll make a feature then. And who should point them in the direction of the fundraising website Kickstarter but Neil Gaiman, the revered author. His name was swirling in pop culture last year because of The Sandman on Netflix. Excellent show, by the way. Thus comes in the clips that I played for you at the very beginning of this video. He started crowdfunding on YouTube before it was cool, and they would literally just do anything in these videos. Like in that first one, he claims that a kitten will die if you don't give him money. Of course, if you decide to pledge more than $5, this kitten might live. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that on your conscience. In this one, one of the actors pretends to be Mark Wahlberg, and then a cop, and then I, I don't know. Proctor! 
that is one dead hooker. I'm Mark Wahlberg from The Departed. I can't recommend checking out all of those enough. They're really funny and it kind of makes me wonder why Mike Flanagan has never pursued a career in comedy, but it worked and it got people's attention, which is a good thing too, because Kickstarter works in kind of a tricky way. They set their goal at $15,000 on Kickstarter and if they didn't meet that within a month, then they wouldn't get any of the money and their donors wouldn't be charged. So that's why they went so full steam ahead on those videos. They ended up far surpassing that initial goal and the movie ended up costing around $70,000. But of course, it didn't come without its challenges. I have a group of talented actors and I have this tunnel, but I don't have a story. Do what you gotta do, you know? No money, no script, no problem. Real filmmakers will still make it happen. And with a great location, Mike Flanagan knew that there was something there. A woman and her sister begin to link a mysterious tunnel to a series of disappearances, including that of her own husband, who has been declared dead in absentia. A tunnel is a fascinating thing because you step into one and all of your senses are altered. Sound is different in a tunnel. The temperature is different in a tunnel. Your pupils dilate and the light on the other side starts to take on different qualities. Everything's amplified and you can hear traffic overhead that if you're in there long enough starts to sound like growls. It's a scary experience if you let it be. I would just stare at that thing every day and say, God, there's gotta be something. Starting there, somewhere along the way, the three billy goats gruff became the template for their story. Another thing guiding production was the unborn fetus of his first child, yes. He was in a relationship with Courtney Bell, who was the lead of Absentia, and yes, she was pregante. They decided to use this to their advantage, and so her character was then pregnant in the movie, and at the time of shooting, she was indeed seven months pregnant. And unfortunately for her, they shot the movie in her and Mike's little Glendale apartment. The shoot lasted 15 days with a skeleton crew of eight people, and you might recognize someone in the cast. Doug Jones stars very briefly in this movie and took on the project because he had an amazing coffee meeting with Mike. Well, what started with coffee ended up just being three hours of them chatting shit and getting along really well. Well, so Doug was like, hell yeah, I want to do your movie. And everybody was was acting very like, oh, Doug Jones is here. You don't always get that on a movie set. The respect was was beyond what I deserved. Uh, so I felt very uh, humbled and um, embarrassed almost that we were having a Doug Jones day. Most of the cast, this was almost everyone's first in, uh, first feature film. So that energy and that excitement, that bright eyed, you know, hopefulness for their, their own future. And this is so, we're so excited to be, we're making a movie. That's an energy that I don't often get on the big studio lots. So th this, that was ex exceptional for me. You'll notice that as a pattern, I think. Flanagan seems to have this sort of childlike wonder that he brings to set that infects everyone around him. That's a quality you need to have though to make good movies, I think. Unless you go the more traditional route of being an extreme dickhead. A lot of directors out there are like, yeah, yeah, I don't know, me just throwing fucking tantrums and screaming at everyone is part of my artistic process. Anyway, Mike Flanagan feels that Doug Jones Day was where his insecurity was showing the most. Because if you watch the movie, take notice of this. They did about 20 setups of Doug Jones coverage. And I think he said they did like 48 takes or something. For all the other scenes, they did maybe two to three takes in coverage. The last fun fact that I wanna share about production is really sweet. Doug Jones's character is experiencing a loss and I won't get into what that is. But in order to get himself into that kind of lonely headspace, he would have Mike's brother hug him. So then while they were rolling, he would be missing that warm embrace, I guess. I just thought that was sweet. I'd never seen anything like that before. This movie did well though. It was actually the first horror film to ever be accepted at the Sonoma International Film Festival. But it has no shortage of accolades. It did extremely well in the festival circuit. I also thought that it would be fun to find old reviews of when the movie came out, but I wasn't entirely successful. The oldest review that I found was from about nine years ago from a YouTube channel called The Horror Show Channel. They pretty much had exclusively positive things to say. It's not not a typical horror movie in that there's, you know, there's a scare every five minutes or there's jump scares or, or loud music blares that, that'll make you jump out of your seats. Mike Flanagan really takes the time to allow the movie to breathe, so to speak. You know, he lets the characters really live in their world. Interestingly, I think those are positive notes that the majority of his work would still receive today. Proving that he's always had his voice and his strong suit is in the creation of character and their emotional development. Now that he had Absentia as his calling card, Flanagan was ready for the next era of his career.
incredible. You know, it's it's been like a nine year journey actually to get to get this story into the shape that it's you know that it is today. Yeah. So it's it's been really really crazy. Similar to Absentia, Flanagan knew that he wanted to make a feature length film, but again, he only had his short film and the concept of a haunted mirror to go off of. For a lot of storytellers, they think of story and character first. For his first two movies, he had a location and a haunted object before he knew what the story was going to be. And his inspiration for using a mirror was something that I didn't expect, and fair warning, it might send you into an existential spiral. I, I've always thought mirrors are really creepy. Our entire self-image, you know, that we have of ourselves is, is from the mirror, but it's it's wrong. It's like, first it's backwards, and then every mirror is slightly imperfect. Like, the glass is always a little warped. Like, we never really understand reality, but we all assume that that's what we're seeing when we look into it. That all kind of plays into the fact that whenever we hear our voice on a recording, we see ourselves in a picture, we're like, ugh, that's me? I don't know which is worse, the fact that I think that I'm more attractive in the mirror than I am in real life, or just the fact that my own perception of myself is so warped because I'll never actually be able to see my myself. That's why that movie is so brilliant to me, because I've never been into haunted objects, but there's always been something about that mirror. Oculus is centered around this mirror that has plagued this family and other victims for hundreds of years. In an effort to exonerate her brother for a tragedy they suffered as children, Kaylee is determined to prove it was the mirror's sinister influence. He has also described the mirror as a portable overlook hotel, which I find fascinating because at that time, he had no idea he would go on to direct Dr. Sleep. That book didn't even exist back then. What's interesting is with this movie, how ferociously Flanagan stuck to his guns about his creative vision, when, like I mentioned, he had been really frustrated by the lack of forward momentum in his career. Several studios were willing to back his movie as early as 2006 if he made it a found footage movie. Because the short film depicts several cameras in the room, many executives got the complete wrong idea about the short. Flanagan has explained that as soon as you make it found footage, everything in the frame becomes objective reality. That totally misses the point of the mirror, which psychologically torments its victims, so they can't trust what they're actually seeing. And in turn, we can't trust it either. It turns everyone into an unreliable narrator. Another psychological layer is, of course, the non-linear nature of the movie. They didn't shoot this film chronologically, and by that I mean in the events of the movie. The entire movie is not chronological, so I needed to clarify that. But this is another pattern according to his actors. This is never really a problem for Mike. We didn't shoot it in chronological order, and there's two different timelines playing out at the same time, so that's a challenge to just know where you're at emotionally, like where to pitch it each time that you're filming a scene. But that's where Mike Flanagan, the director, came in and he was just so on top of it. He was like, you're here and this is how you're feeling. And I was like, great. Also, I was about today years old when I learned that Karen Gillan is Scottish. Literally never knew that. I've only ever known her as Kaylee from Oculus, Nebula, and I did, I saw Jumanji back when that came out. And she's always playing an American, so I didn't know. It's just like how I didn't know that Tony Collette was Australian until like two years ago. Anyway, Mike Flanagan is really good at keeping track of everything, which sometimes is the hardest part of directing. The communication and execution of a creative vision is not necessarily the hardest part. Keeping the 10 jillion moving parts of your creative vision straight so you can get things done is probably the hardest part. I could only imagine how difficult it was already to keep the nonlinear story of the movie straight in his head. Couldn't imagine keeping that straight, shooting it out of order. There's no way. They got it done though, and this movie premiered at the 2013 Toronto Film Festival where it got the attention of Jason Blum. I actually got involved with this movie after these guys had made it already, so kind of like we did on Paranormal Activity. It screened in Toronto and I loved it. The distribution was in question how it was going to happen, and so there was a way to try and lend our name in marketing. A lot of the stuff that we did on Paranormal Activity we took to this movie, and I was psyched to do it and helped out. It was released on April 11th of 2014 and made $44 million internationally. It gained mostly positive attention. It sits at a 75% on Rotten Tomatoes, and it got a glowing review in the Chicago Sun-Times the day after its release. It takes a high level of confidence, maybe even audacity, to set out to make yet another haunted mirror movie. But thanks to the wonderfully twisted style of director Mike Flanagan, and four terrific young actors playing two characters some 11 years apart, Oculus is one of the more elegant, scary movies in recent memory. Another haunted mirror movie? I'm sorry, is there another one besides Oculus? Anyway, the response remains slightly mixed, though. It has a 3.2 on Letterboxd, which is not bad at all. It did get two stars on Roger Ebert's website, though, so some critics are not really with it. Overall, a success, though, and it opened doors for funding his next feature project. It was also the first film ever that he worked on with Kate Siegel, which is his current spouse and creative partner. So the next movie 
movie we're gonna talk about is Hush. Lucky for us, the entire backstory of Hush was recently posted to Tumblr of all places by Mike Flanagan himself. Well, the thing about the WGA strike is that this is where all of my writing energy is going, so get ready for a long post. Go Mike, by the way, we see you all out on those picket lines. He kicks it off by explaining that Before I Wake was finished in 2015, but it kept getting pushed back. But after Oculus, he and Kate began dating and they were both kind of struggling with what to do next. I was a director who had only had one real movie released. My second film was trapped in limbo and I was terrified I wouldn't get another chance. Kate was a struggling actor who was not considered for any big roles. We were both struggling financially, both lived hand to mouth, were mired in debt and wanted something to truly break us into the industry we'd fought to be a part of for so long. The question kept coming up, how do we take control of our careers? So yet again, Flanagan had a concept or a challenge that he wanted to construct his movie around. This time that challenge being a deaf protagonist. Originally the movie was going to be called Silence and they wanted to make their own version of Wait Until Dark, which is a movie starring Audrey Hepburn who plays a blind woman. They also wrote this movie together purposefully as a vehicle for Kate Siegel. That's why this movie existed at all, as a vehicle for her, because we believe that if no one else will cast you as the lead of their film, you should create your own opportunity. However, this is a point of contention for the deaf community who largely have kind of disregarded this film as not having accurate representation, but I'll get into all of that when I talk about the reception of this film. Trevor Macy is someone who I probably should have talked about at this point. He is a longtime collaborator of Mike Flanagan's. He is a producer for most of his movies and TV shows. So he was on this project too, but Mike Flanagan also decided to reach out to his contacts at Blumhouse and Intrepid Pictures. He thought that he would have luck pitching this movie to Jason Blum. Great, let's do it, he said and got up. It was the fastest pitch meeting of my career. I think it probably still is. I was in there for less than five minutes. So now it was time to get down to writing, which he and Kate did together. They came up with all the break-in scenarios by each taking turns trying to break into their Glendale home. Then they headed up to the Stanley Hotel and they stayed in the infamous room 217 where Stephen King wrote The Shining to finish it. This wouldn't be the only time he'd write in that famous room either. Yet again, they shot in Fairhope, Alabama, which is where Oculus and Before I Wake were also shot. It was shot sequentially in 18 days, exclusively doing night shoots. So a pretty grueling experience because Kate Siegel never got to have a break. She's pretty much in every single frame of the movie and they couldn't afford a stunt double. So she got some very real bruises from this experience. After successfully not killing each other through this crazy endeavor, Mike Flanagan and Kate Siegel decided they wanted to collaborate in every aspect of their life. So then about a year later, they got married. Now they have two kids together. Look at them go. As far as distribution goes, this movie premiered at the South by Southwest Festival. And so a very lucky few got to experience this movie in a theater. I'll always be a little bummed that we sold the movie to Netflix. I've been fortunate enough to see this movie in a packed theater on just a handful of occasions. And it was such a wonderful theatrical experience. You can hear a pin drop for long stretches punctuated by bursts of applause as Maddie claws moments of victory out of her situation. For the last seven years, it's been available on Netflix. Their license agreement ran out in April this year and we decided to take it somewhere else based in no small part to Netflix's unimaginably short-sighted refusal to support physical media releases. The idea of this movie vanishing forever into the bowels of Netflix's content grinder was just a little more than I could handle. Currently, they're exploring other distribution options and so maybe we'll get lucky and we'll get a physical release, but who knows? That's one thing that I respect about Mike Flanagan is that he always speaks up for whatever he thinks is right, even if it's up against the studio that has kept him employed for the last like seven, eight years. Speaking of standing up for what's right, let's get into maybe the only controversy this man has ever found himself in in his whole career. To my surprise, Hush was not received well by deaf audiences. Mike made a tweet responding to the deaf community that I think has long since been deleted because I can't find this anywhere. It's a little spicy. I didn't find the hashtag to be all that necessary, but I digress. I found a few deaf and hard of hearing creators here on YouTube that actually spoke out about the issue at the time. The first is Amanda McDonough, and you can clearly tell she speaks as well as any hearing actress. I am a deaf actor who can speak just as well as any hearing actor. Now, in regards to your latest tweet, not all deaf people are mute. If your casting agent wanted to find authenticity, we exist. Another YouTuber named Ricky Pointer pointed out a lot of the inaccuracies of both ASL and the abilities of the deaf protagonist. There's a part of the movie where her neighbor comes over and she's trying to sign with her and she's like, oh, you don't have to do that. Ricky was like, that's weird. We love when our friends try to learn our language. She also didn't like that she spoke aloud while she was signing because I guess the two are completely different languages. So that was obviously only to service hearing audiences. Same with the fact that Maddie could read lips to 
a hyper unrealistic degree, again, catering only to hearing audiences. She doesn't have flash alerts on her phone either, and one of the most egregious offenses contains a spoiler, so if you wanna skip ahead, then you can do so. There's no way that her friend could be killed three feet away from her and she wouldn't realize it. At the very least, she would feel the frantic vibrations of her friend banging on the door, especially because that sense is hyper attuned due to being deaf. And apparently at the time, they weren't responding well to the criticism either. I think what really makes this movie bad for a lot of us in the community is the reaction from Mike and Kate. But even with the most calm, constructive criticism, these people were blacking left and right. Kate Siegel has me blocked. I think Mike might have me blocked. So that's not great, but a few weeks ago on the Tumblr post, Mike Flanagan brought up the criticism. Now it's worth mentioning here that we later took some heat for not casting a deaf actress to play Maddie. Honestly, it simply wasn't something that had occurred to us at the time. Before Maddie was ever conceived as a character, this movie was a vehicle for Kate. That's the only reason it exists. We created it together specifically to launch her career as a leading lady. No one else was ever going to be considered for that role. In the years that followed, we've listened to the criticism, we meant no offense, and actually naively thought we were doing something positive for representation by creating this strong deaf protagonist. We hired and collaborated with a deaf consultant throughout the process who was happy to work with us and thought the character was really exciting. Kate studied ASL for months, and we believed we were doing something good for the deaf community. We were surprised by the criticisms and forced to re-examine the whole thing after the fact. If I had to do it over again, I would still cast Kate. Again, the whole point was for her to help create her own breakout opportunity, but we likely would have conceived the character differently. If we made the movie today, Kate would still play Maddie Young. We just might have made her able to hear. One important thing here is the fact that he's not cowering away from the criticism. I'm glad that there is at least an acknowledgement of it. The last director that I covered was Tim Burton, who responds very abrasively to criticisms about racist undertones in his work, or he doesn't respond at all. It really is just solely an acknowledgement and them being like, yeah, I mean, we did kind of re-examine our actions. It's not really an apology, like at no point is he ever saying sorry, but I'm also not deaf or hard of hearing, so not my place really to comment on it. When it comes to the reception, this is widely hailed as his best film. It is the highest rated on Rotten Tomatoes with a score of 93%. It was also known as pretty much the best horror option on Netflix for years and years and years. Now, unfortunately, it exists in limbo, but hopefully not for too long. Now, the last film in the Blumhouse era would be Ouija Origin of Evil. Right after Hush, I actually went and did a Ouija 2 for Jason, which is so not the Ouija movie everyone's expecting. Now that I, I forgot that you were involved and now I realize, oh, the movie actually could be good. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the twist. Little riff on the fact that the first Ouija was so bad, respect. In 1965, Los Angeles, a widowed mother and her two daughters add a new stunt to bolster their seance scam business and unwittingly invite authentic evil into their home. When the youngest daughter is overtaken by the merciless spirit, this small family confronts unthinkable fears to save her and send her possessor back to the other side. Not a lot of promotional material for this movie, but I guess this is kind of typical for Blumhouse. Marketing wise, these days they ride really hard for all of their surefire franchise movies, but these smaller projects with up and coming directors, not so much. Especially considering how bad the first movie was, this was really a moment for him to step up and prove himself, which he did. With a budget of $12 million, this movie went on to make $81.7 million worldwide. The critical response was pretty good, sits at an 83% on Rotten Tomatoes. And again, I thought that it would be fun to find old reviews of when the movie first came out because I was curious about what the popular thought was at the time. And I found a review from October 22nd of 2016 from a one Cody Leach. He was excited about this movie going into it for a few reasons, one of them being Mike Flanagan himself. The second reason was the director choice in Mike Flanagan. He's the one who directed Oculus, which is a pretty creepy, underrated movie. I actually like that movie quite a bit. And then he did this little movie on Netflix that not a whole lot of people saw called Hush, which again is a really underrated movie. It's very creepy. It's very unique. There's a lot of really great execution. He shouts out the underrated movies Hush and Oculus from director Mike Flanagan and goes on to praise pretty much everything about Ouija except for the ending. That's popular criticism that I don't think has changed all that much. In fact, when I rewatch the movie, I have that exact same thought every single time. Now, the eras of Mike Flanagan's career are definitely interwoven, but for simplicity's sake, we will call that the end of the Blumhouse era.
the Netflix era will be a real mishmash in terms of the order that I'm covering everything. I'm gonna cover all the movies first, and then in chapter five, I'll cover all the TV shows that sound good. So first up on the slate is Before I Wake. Like I mentioned, could technically be part of the Blumhouse era as it was finished before they even made Hush. But when you hear the US release date, you'll understand why this is part of the Netflix era. Before I Wake is about a couple who take in a foster child after losing their own young boy. However, this orphan's dreams and nightmares physically manifest, much to the delight and horror of his new parents. Again, there is not that much information about this movie online. Hardly any interviews or promotional material because the release of this movie was kind of a nightmare. Flanagan made this movie for Intrepid Pictures and it was originally called Somnia, which I never knew. It kind of trips me out because my horror short debut last year was called Somnum. And I'm like, damn, great minds. <laughs> he fought them actually on changing the title to Before I Wake, but he lost. Anyway, I think the extreme lack of promotional materials online is probably due to the fact that the studio basically went bankrupt before it released. One of the only fun tidbits that I did find is that Mike Flanagan's first son, Rigby, made his acting debut in this movie. Very small part, he plays the young Cody, who the older version was played by Jacob Tremblay. The movie was delayed three different times, and it never changed a single frame in the year and a half that it was delayed. On July 31st of 2016, it premiered at the Fantasia Film Festival, but then it wouldn't release until January 5th of 2018. Before I Wake was met with pretty lukewarm reviews that have never really been re-examined. Not to worry though, because this did not stop Netflix from hopping on the Mike Flanagan Express. Now from here on out, you could also consider this the adaptation era of Mike Flanagan's career because hardly anything he directs from this point outward is original work, starting with an adaptation of Gerald's Game. A couple tries to spice up their marriage in a remote lake house. After the husband dies unexpectedly, the wife is left handcuffed to their bed frame and must fight to survive and break free. This was a huge deal for Mike Flanagan. I'm sure this was a dream project for him and he pretty much idolized Stephen King. Yet again, no promotional material for this movie. This was before Mike Flanagan became a cash cow for Netflix, and so I guess at this point they weren't sending him out for press junkets. But how dare they not consider that I might make a video essay on his work someday? There's an interesting tie-in to Hush, though, that I had expected and noticed, but now I know it for sure. And it has to do with the most controversial part of Hush. The most controversial part of the script was a lengthy sequence in which Maddie imagines several possible outcomes, and we see them play out as she talks to herself in her own mind. Mind. There was concern from the producers that this would knock people out of the movie. I fought hard for it, not only because it was a great sequence, I thought, but because it was also a test run for the very narrative device that I wanted to employ if I ever got to make Gerald's Game, which at the time was a dream project. That sequence involves some pretty big spoilers, so I won't get into it. What I will say is that at the time, I found it pretty weird and repetitive in comparison to Hush, because at the time of watching it, I had no idea that that was like the whole intention. Weirdly, this movie was released before Before I Wake in 2017. It released on September 29th to Netflix. Again, it was shot in Alabama, this time in a town called Mobile. Also familiar, Trevor Macy is producing for him yet again, which I don't think I'll mention from here on out because you could probably just assume that he is. It stars many of his repeat actors that you'll see again and again, like Carla Gugino, Henry Jackson Thomas, of course, Kate Siegel. Maybe worth noting here that no one is ever in an uproar about him casting his wife like they are about Rob Zombie. I have yet to cover Rob Zombie, I haven't seen most of his movies, but I'm gonna take a wild guess that it's probably because Kate Siegel actually delivers on the talent end. I think Sherry Moon might be riding on that nepotism alone, if I'm gonna be brutally honest, but let me not really speak on that before I watch all of her work. Anyway, critically, this is Mike Flanagan's second highest rated movie. It sits at a 91%. The King himself also got an early screener and was a huge fan. Saw a rough cut of Mike Flanagan's Gerald's Game yesterday. Horrifying, hypnotic, terrific. It's gonna freak you out. So you got to see it in February. That was, woo, that was like eight months before it actually released. It's a little baffling to me though, because on Letterboxd and IMDb, it sits around like a 65% rating. And it's not something that's really brought up when people discuss Mike Flanagan's work. It seems kind of largely forgotten in the zeitgeist. The next movie is the complete opposite. It is finally time to talk about a little movie called Dr. Sleep. Dr. Sleep is of course the long awaited sequel to The Shining. It follows Danny Torrance as he struggles through sobriety and trying to protect a young Abra from a shine-eating coven of evil creatures called the True Knot. He took care to go all the way back to where the original novel left off, to, to be there with young Danny and, and with Wendy and with Dick Halloran to very defiantly in the first chapters say, I am completely obliterating 
every choice that Kubrick made in this adaptation. I am replanting my flag as the creator and the author of this story. I loved the book, Dr. Sleep. I loved the work that he did with Danny Torrance. I loved seeing an author who had written a book that I, I believed was an incredibly self-conscious examination of addiction. And now decades later, reapproaching that same world through the lens of recovery. The filmmaker in me who so admired what Stanley Kubrick had done with his adaptation of that story was a little crushed. I remember thinking that if anyone was crazy enough to try to make that movie, they'd have a really hard time doing it. I do recall talking to friends after I finished the book and just saying, if they try to make a movie, they're really fucked. There are many differences and so much that I want to discuss between The Shining, Doctor Sleep, the books and the movies, but I'm going to refrain from that today because I said no spoilers. And my dad and I also already did a spoiler-filled live stream talking about The Shining and Doctor Sleep, where I talked about a lot of those differences. And because I'm going to be doing an original verse remake comparison video, doing a deep dive on The Shining and Stephen King's The Shining. Hopefully you're already sort of aware of how Stephen King hated Stanley Kubrick's original adaptation because that kind of paints this background story here. Flanagan recalls never being as nervous on a project as he was for this one. King okayed him as a director because he really enjoyed Gerald's game but the two of them wouldn't meet until after Dr. Sleep was finished. But let's rewind to the beginning. I bet you could take a guess where Mike Flanagan wrote this movie. Yes, he headed back to room 217 at the Stanley Hotel. It's one of the few rooms in the hotel where they haven't uh, renovated the bathroom. Mm. So it still has the original old clawfoot tub that was there when he stayed there. And that still has this curtain that hangs around it. There's something about the little bay window in that bathroom that I think gets a lot of wind coming up off the mountain. Uh. And when you sit in the bed where he would have been and you look through the open open bathroom door, you can see the tub and the curtain and the curtain moves. You can just see that seed of inspiration where it's like, what yeah. if someone is in that bathtub? After getting into the spirit of things and finishing the script, then came time to cast everyone. Mike Flanagan knew that Rebecca Ferguson was going to be his Rose the Hat within the first 10 minutes of meeting her over Zoom. They auditioned over a thousand little girls before they cast Kylie Curran, who is also gonna be starring in The Fall of the House of Usher later this year, by the way. And Ewan McGregor has an interesting story too, but we need some context from King first. I was a practicing drunk when I wrote The Shining. I'm functional, but practicing. And when I wrote Dr. Sleep, uh, I'd been sober for a long time, and I wanted to write Dan's story from that perspective. McGregor was drawn to the character of Danny because he himself was 17 years sober at the time. He and Mike Flanagan met up in the editing room of Haunting of Hill House and where he could talk about what the role meant to him. From that, Flanagan felt that he was perfect for the role. There was so much in it that was deeply personal to both of them. And then the making of the movie was deeply impressive. They completely rebuilt certain rooms of the Overlook and Flanagan has described multiple times how everyone turned into a child again when they were on those sets. They even had an adult-sized trike made for the adults to ride around in. And speaking of, the iconic trike scene was one of the many that they recreated for this film. They recreated many of the same shots, including the bloody elevator, but theirs was done with CGI blood. The only shots literally lifted from the original were the island in the canyon and the two shots immediately following it of the car driving through the canyon. They just added snow and they made it nighttime. One last story that I think is fun is about one of the most horrific deaths put to screen in a horror movie in the last decade at least. I won't spoil who it is in all of that, but I will say that it was so horrible that it made Rebecca Ferguson burst into tears while they were filming it. And after the first take, pretty much the entire crew abandoned their post, like the gaffers, everybody, because it was so disconcerting. Flanagan was in such shock that he forgot to yell cut. When you see the movie, if you haven't already, then you will know exactly which scene I'm talking about. There's even a slightly longer version of it in the director's cut, which speaking of, it's probably the most prominent director's cut of a horror movie since like Rob Zombie's Halloween. Just in terms of how many people have sought it out and watched both it and the theatrical cut. I myself have seen both. The director's cut is definitely far more personal, contains way more character development. It's for that reason that Mike Flanagan far prefers his own director's cut, but he did have to trim it down. The studio more or less demanded a two and a half hour movie and his director's cut was three hours long. Once the screener was available, Mike Flanagan got to meet his childhood hero. But I, I went to Maine with the movie and I sat with him in a theater and watched it with him. Mm -hmm. Sitting right next to him, just staring at him. I can't imagine. But I, I don't remember the movie. I, I watched every micro reaction that he had. So I, I was on pins and needles. And at the end of the movie, he, he leaned over and he said, I think you did a great job. And I kind of shat myself and, <laughs> and showed myself out of the theater. Uh -huh. And I've seen other interviews where he's said this, that Dr. Sleech changed the way he felt about the Shining movie. 
and that it warmed it up for him a little. Me as well, but I'll get to that later. Making this movie was also what led to Mike Flanagan finally deciding to get sober. And when he made that choice, he sent this really thoughtful letter to King, just thanking him for inspiring him, basically. King was very touched, and he wrote back, letting him know that now they actually have the same sober birthday. It was completely unintentional on Mike's part, but now the two of them are inextricably linked till death do they part. No, I'm just kidding. But am I, though? That's one secret I'll never tell. Doctor Sleep wasn't the sensation that it should have been, though. It made about $72.3 million after having a $45 million budget. So when Flanagan talks about it, he considers it a flop because it only made $31 million domestically. But the people that have seen it and fans of The Shining, pretty much everyone loves it. Stephen King told him, just give it time. The same thing happened to The Shining, give it time. He has been in defense of it since day one. I mostly write books and hope for the best. Box office numbers aside, Mike Flanagan's film is excellent. If people choose not to go, that is their choice, but when something is good, I cheer for it. Regardless, this unexpected loss led to the cancellation of a project that Mike Flanagan was supposed to lead, and it was going to be a prequel series centered on Dick Halloran. Not to worry, though, because Netflix has kept that man booked and busy with other adaptations. I really love knowing that I get to make a 10-hour movie. That's my sweet spot. I, I get to spend all the time I want to with the characters. I get to really play with the arc. I get to really tease out when we turn those cards over for the audience. This final era that I want to talk about today is one of the most important. It really put him on the map, starting, of course, with The Haunting of Hill House. This modern reimagining of the Shirley Jackson novel follows siblings who, as children, grew up in what would go on to become the most famous haunted house in the country. Now adults, they are forced back together in the face of tragedy and must finally confront the ghosts of their past. Some of those ghosts still lurk in their minds, while others may actually be stalking the shadows of Hill House. With this show, Flanagan expressed that he wanted wanted to take audiences back to the roots of horror before it was just about being afraid. This meant digging deep and using personal familial experiences to develop the Crane family and tell their story. Apparently part of doing this meant directing the entirety of one episode in one shot. In order to pull this off, they shut down production for six weeks to block and rehearse this episode. The cast got together on weekends just to practice. Everyone was very committed. It's obviously a very taxing project, and with all this going on, Mike Flanagan said that they were constantly facing extinction. They were always in fear that production would get shot down, and he cites this as the worst production experience he's ever had. I lost 45 pounds making that show. I came out of it looking like I was about to die. <laughs> you know, it brutalized personal relationships. So we, we finished the show and was just kind of like, no more TV. And at one point during production, Steven Spielberg decided to take his name off of the project. They were being partially funded by Amblin, and so at any point during production, Steven Spielberg could decide, yeah, I want my name on this, or no, I don't. On Hill House, he was like, nah. Despite all of that, The Haunting of Hill House is probably the most successful and most viewed content he's ever made. It's tied for first place on Rotten Tomatoes with Hush, with an audience score of 91% and a critic score of 93%. Forbes posed the question, is this the best original show Netflix has ever made? According to IMDb ratings, right now The Haunting of Hill House is in fact the highest user rated Netflix original show I can find. And that's even if you cheat by adding in all time great shows Netflix adopted like Black Mirror or Arrested Development. The rating has dipped to an 8.6 six now, but that's still with over 250,000 reviews. I wish that Netflix was a little bit more forthcoming with its viewership numbers, but we can't have transparency from our giant streaming services, can we? Most of the time, anytime that you try to figure out the viewership of something, it gives you like percentages based on demand of other shows. And it's like, hey, that's not what I asked for. So unfortunately, I won't really be able to compare the reception of his shows very well because of how differently they operate to the box office, especially because most of the time, all the statistics are only from the last 30 days, kind of like YouTube. I did find one website that actually had some viewership numbers to share. The Haunting of Hill House has generated over 32 million demand expressions since it debuted on 12 October. A huge number to accumulate in such a small amount of time, meaning that it only ranks behind The Walking Dead's 59.23 million expressions and American Horror Story's 79.99 million. So I think it's safe to say that it was Netflix's most viewed original show at the time ever. Season one of Stranger Things also seems 
seemed massive at the time, but in an age range of 18 to 49, it only had 14 million viewers in that same time. Or expressions, views, like I don't, li I don't know. I'm really sorry that these numbers and age ranges are both oddly specific and very vague at the same time. I blame the sloppy bitch that is Netflix. Anyway, it won best series at the Fangoria Chainsaw Awards and it won superior achievement in a screenplay at the Bram Stoker Awards. And at the Saturn Awards, Henry Thomas won best actor in a streaming presentation. The point is Hill House was a sensation and so we all eagerly awaited the next project, The Haunting of Bly Manor. This time adapting the work of Henry James, a young governess arrives at Bly Manor and begins to see apparitions haunting the estate. Yet again, for whatever reason, they didn't really make any featurettes of this show. They did not send Mike Flanagan out on a press junket, which is weird to me. Maybe that wasn't quite as popular at that time for streaming services. I guess maybe it still isn't, huh? But the fact that Hill House was such a success, I was hoping for more interviews with him. There are actor interviews, sure, but that's not who I'm doing my deep dive on. Maybe someday because Victoria Pedretti, she, oof, that's an interesting woman. Anyway, there's not that much to uncover with this show because it has much of the same cast as Hill House. They also got really lucky with production because they wrapped and finished on everything in February of 2020. But the juiciest bit of info that I found is the inspiration behind this ghostly love story. If there's one thing that I hope fans take away from this season of Bly Manor, I think it's that wonderful connection between a great love story and a great ghost story. The two are really the same thing, how each of us, when we fall in love, is kind of giving birth to a new ghost, something that's gonna follow us for the rest of our lives. Kind of happy, kind of pissed that he put it so eloquently. You ever been haunted by an ex? If the answer is no, then I'm inclined to believe that maybe you've never dated someone or you don't have a soul. But that would make sense because you gave it to me. The Haunting of Bly Manor did not fare as well as Hill House, but that was a really tough act to follow. People were just not as into this show as its predecessor. The Guardian gave it a two out of five star review with the tagline, ear jangling accents are the most terrifying thing and Mike Flanagan's follow-up to the supernatural hit Hill House. It seems to have dispensed with the need for shocks, horror, plot, the doling out of information at steady intervals, and a decent script. Ouch. Roger Ebert's website also gave it two stars from reviewer Nick Allen. For one, it's not haunting, even in its intriguing exploration of how ghosts have feelings too. But that leads to a larger problem. In its attempt to escape the shadow of Hill House, Blind Manor takes a misguided pivot into gothic soap opera, stranding its performers and fans in the process. Blind Manor makes you work overtime just to feel something. If Hill House provided a blueprint for how to tell a long, heartbreaking, and authentically scary story, the failures and indulgences of Bly Manor are unfortunate examples of how not to. Rotten Tomatoes' critic score was still banging. It sits at an 88% critically, but the audience score really fell off because there it currently sits at a 66%. And I myself gave it a pretty negative review at the time of its release, but don't watch that. That was like when I first started my channel. Ew. Not to worry though, because for every failure, Mike Flanagan bounces right back. Midnight Mass was the next Flanagan sensation, releasing the next year in 2021. The arrival of a charismatic priest brings miracles, mysteries, and renewed religious fervor to a dying town. This show also deals heavily with alcoholism and recovery, and Flanagan has said that it is the most personal work he's ever made. Riley kind of represented, in a lot more ways than I was even aware of at the time this all started, Riley represented uh, an avatar for me. You meet Riley in the pilot, kind of enacting what really was my biggest fear. Maybe the thing I was the most afraid of in my life, which was as I was first starting to write this, I was dealing with alcohol, but had not yet gotten sober. And the, the fear that really kind of had me by the throat wasn't that something would happen to me or that I'd hurt myself or that I'd die in a car accident. It was, it was that, you know, what if I killed someone else and lived? He was still drinking at the time of initially writing this story, which dates all the way back to before Hush. It started out as a novel, and fun fact, the pages of Midnight Mass can be seen in Hush. It's the book that Maddie is writing. She even references the main character, Riley, and she asks her friend what she thinks of him. With Dr. Sleep, there was a lot of discussion about AA and how Mike Flanagan feels about it, and that all came up again here. He thinks the program is wonderful, but he personally never connected with the religious undertones of its credo. And that's another very personal element of this show, all the religious underpinnings. He was Catholic and at a certain point he realized he wasn't actually being critically taught the Bible. He sort of woke up if you will. All he knew was what he had been fed and the church's version of the Bible and so he became kind of disillusioned when he decided to read the Bible for himself and many other religious texts. The scariest examples of horror that I can recall experiencing first in my life I found in the Bible where you have rivers of blood and angels coming to the door to slaughter children and pillars of fire and all sorts of horrors that are just baked into, into 
the Bible itself. As a young Catholic, that was incredibly impactful on me. I also highly recommend listening to the entire two hour podcast that he did with the Friendly Atheist. He's so compassionate towards others' belief systems, but also especially towards those who have been wronged by organized religion, and subsequently those who are wronged by religiously motivated politics. This show is not about religion and spouting a belief system. It's about faith and how it can be distorted. They wanted to argue both sides as earnestly and passionately as they could. He also brings up how he wove in the themes about men's profound fear of not being able to control women. He talked about how we're devolving into a society where facts just don't matter anymore. I could listen to someone pick his brain for hours and hours and hours. So anyway, with a show that was so deviant to his upbringing, he was asked if that was a problem with his family. My parents really loved the show. I was I was bracing for for it to be a family scandal, but they really they really loved it. I've read passionate defenses of the show written by Catholic priests who say that a lot of the messaging in the show is is a necessary wake up call for the church today. I think it's wonderful how attuned he actually is to how his work affects the communities that he's commenting on. It seems that he's maybe developed that skill since his run in with the deaf community, if you will. Aside from the multi dimensional themes presented in Midnight Mass, and how much of himself was woven into the story, it was also the best production experience he ever had. Unfortunately, this is one of the shows where I couldn't find any viewership numbers for, so we're stuck with the demand percentages bullshit. Flanagan did say in an interview that this show had about a fourth of the viewership as The Haunting of Hill House, so maybe we can assume that it had about 10 million viewers in its first month, but we can only assume that if I am doing both math and interpreting these numbers correctly, neither of which are super likely. But this is the kind of thing I'm looking at. This, it seems like a glorified Rotten Tomato score. Like, what the hell do I do with this? Of all the horror titles in the United States, this one is in the 76th percentile of watch demand. It has a similar score, if you will, of 7.7 .7 on IMDb. So definitely good, but not quite in the same ballpark as Hill House. And news outlets treated it pretty well. This is from The Guardian. Tragedy brews slowly on the crock pot as we come to know its residents so that when the violence and utter bleakness does finally arrive, there is still beauty and hope too. I bawled my eyes out at the end. I have had friends who don't normally like horror do the same. So maybe I will never watch this wonderful harrowing show again, but Midnight Mass will stay with me forever. On the Roger Ebert website though, it got two and a half stars, so not a lot of Flanagan love over there. Some of Flanagan's most ambitious elements here play with the idea that the Bible is truly a horror story while also weaving very king-like themes into the fabric. Primarily the conflict between human responsibility and the thinking that belief can wash away all sin. Even though I'm a huge fan, I can admit that his themes and concepts sometimes overwhelm his plotting. He's prone to tangents that don't serve the greater purpose and has a habit of underlining his ideas instead of trusting readers to unpack them. And yet, he's still such a consistently entertaining craftsman. The audience score jumped up from Blind Manor to a decent 78%, but online, people ride so hard for this show. I think it's especially personal for anyone who has experienced any degree of Catholic guilt, which I feel like is probably most of us, because that goddamn church imposes itself every which way from Tuesday on to our society. I've gotten a lot of comments from people that it's the best horror show they've ever seen. It's gotten so much love in the horror community. The same can't really be said for his next and last show we have to cover today. The Midnight Club was released just last year in October of 2022. At a manor with a mysterious history, eight members of the Midnight Club meet each night at midnight to tell sinister stories and to look for signs of the supernatural from beyond. The Midnight Club is an adaptation of different works from Christopher Pike, which Mike Flanagan grew up reading. Flanagan thinks that his books are just as iconic as R.L. Stein, but they've never really gotten the adaptations they deserve. So again, he was like, okay, fine, f off, I'll do it myself. However, when he first tried to way back in college, it did not go over well. I tried to adapt The Midnight Club in college as a movie, and like I wrote a script for it, and I was all excited, and I put a business plan together to finance this independent feature, and I got in touch with the publishers to say this is what I wanted to do, and they sent me a cease and desist letter and ordered me to destroy all the scripts. It's so strange to me because you would think that him or his publishing company would want kind of a share of the R.L. Stein type love. But in the past few years, he decided to just reach out to Pike directly on Facebook and then he got the green light. What's special about this show is that he only directed the first two episodes, leaving the rest to be spotlights for up and coming other directors. One heavy theme of this show though is death and living in hospice care. They had young sick people to help them in the writer's room and consult with them, but they also had Heather Langenkamp. She was actually a huge help in this regard because this was something that 
I never knew. She lost her son Atticus to brain cancer at just 27 years old. So she really helped to create the authentic tone of the show. And on a lighter note, Dream Warriors is one of Flanagan's favorite movies, so how special that he got to work with Heather Langenkamp on this show. In terms of viewership, now I guess they primarily use hours watched. So the show got over 90 million watch hours in its first 20 days. To give a little bit of perspective, let's compare it to Squid Game. That got 31.7 million watch hours by its second week. It's not a great comparison, especially because I had to do some math because for Squid Game, they use minutes for whatever reason. I guess because billion looks a lot better than million. Netflix, can you just be like YouTube for like two fucking seconds? You're on my video, right? So if you take a peek at the bottom left corner of the screen, let your eyes travel down about another centimeter. That's called a view count. Have you ever heard of it? Anyways, let's talk reception where it's not looking too good for old Mikey. This is his lowest ranked show on Rotten Tomatoes by a mile. I'll probably talk about my theory about that during the ranking portion of this video. Shockingly, it has a higher ranking than Midnight Mass on Roger Ebert's site. Teenagers are supposed to be unrefined, uncertain, and unguarded. And so every time the Midnight Club felt a little rough around the edges, I was reminded of the swirl of adolescent emotion that intensifies around issues as serious as death. And perhaps more importantly, it could be something that really speaks to a young person who has been forced to deal with death unfairly, looking for a story to help them figure out how to write their own. The tragic thing about this is that, surprisingly, it was the first show he ever made with the intention to set it up for a season two, and it was denied. But I will have linked down below in my master resource post his plans for season two. He posted the entire outline on Twitter, and it sounded fantastic. To me, I think it would have been beautiful and a huge improvement on the first season, because this is probably one of the most emotional shows of his, if you can believe that, if you've already seen like Midnight Mass and Hill House. On Collider, they say Mike Flanagan's latest series may just be his most emotional outing to date. It also remains strong critically on Rotten Tomatoes with an 87%, which is the exact same score as Midnight Mass. And I don't know if it's because of the absolute sea of content that we got last year that was all delayed because of the pandemic, but this show didn't make any noise. I talked about it during my monthly recap of October and everything, and no one else was really talking about it, which bums me out because those season two plans were so beautiful, I'm telling you. Of course, what else can we expect from Netflix when sometimes they will cancel shows within a month of their release? This has not slowed down his career though. Mike Flanagan is currently booked and busy. The final limited series and adaptation that he's making for Netflix is The Fall of the House of Usher, which is based on Edgar Allan Poe's short stories. In a lot of ways, I feel like it's the perfect bow for that Netflix era of Intrepid to pull so many cast members and elements and themes from all the shows that we did there. You'll see many familiar faces of the Flana family, including a new one, Mark Hamill. It's most likely coming out this October, according to Trevor Macy, as you know, longtime collaborator. He's also working on an adaptation of Christopher Pike's Season of Passage. It's an interesting mix of sci-fi and horror. The story follows famed Dr. Lauren Wagner, one of two survivors of a Martian expedition investigating what happened to a prior crew of Russian astronauts who never found their way back to Earth. He's also working on a very secretive adaptation of Dark Tower. So far, he's worked on very extensive outlines for King to go over. He also described the project as his holy grail and revealed that the Dark Tower is actually separate from his Amazon deal, meaning he's free to shop the series around to different studios and networks. Finally, he's working on yet another adaptation of Stephen King called Life of Chuck. It will be starring Tom Hiddleston and Mark Hamill yet again, so I kind of wonder if Mark Hamill is gonna become part of the Flanna family. And I am excited for literally all of those. What about you? And actually that does it for the deep dive portion of this video, the deep dive into Mike Flanagan's career. How we feeling? Do you need a snack? Maybe go grab one if you need one or a drink. I'll just, I'll wait right here. I'll conclude with some key takeaways that I have as follows. The man is a talent. He's obviously a very special voice in horror. From the beginning of his feature career with Absentia, it's clear that character has always meant a great deal to him. It reminds me of the Siskel and Ebert clip that I featured in my Tim Burton deep dive, where Siskel is talking about how directors either love people or they hate people. He concluded that Burton loves people, and I think that Mike Flanagan might be the same. He's so interested in exploring humanity's pitfalls, but more importantly, our value, especially to one another. He also just seems like a good person, like a really nice, personable human being. I always say never idolize celebrities. You do not know them. Don't expect disappointment, but be ready to drop anyone on a dime's notice because you don't know who they are behind the scenes. So take this with a grain of salt because we have a very limited view of this man, but I am just making this assumption because I have seen a two hour long unbroken clip of him in a podcast. He hasn't let his success go to his head. If anything, it seems to have made him more humble. He is so generous with how he engages with people who are interested with him and his work. The length of the Friendly Atheist podcast was unplanned. He sat there probably 
probably expecting to do like whatever, a 40 minute interview or whatever is standard. And then on a whim, just sat there and talked to her for over two hours. And at the very end was just gassing her up. I think it's great what you do. So please keep doing it and keep doing it the way that you're doing it and do everything you can to ignore anybody who tells you otherwise. Got a fantastic way of communicating and it's wonderful that that you're doing this show. So I, I'm grateful to be a part of it and I hope you keep keep at it. He also told another story about how after Dr. Sleep was released, he got a really angry negative review on Twitter. So then he actually replied to it, which he says that you shouldn't do. But then he got a DM from the same guy who was like, I'm sorry, like I've just been having a rough go of it lately. And Mike Flanagan was like, me too. They started talking. They are still friends to this day. That's not me encouraging you to message him, by the way. He is a busy guy. But you saw it on the set of Dr. Sleep. He's just this kid with a burning love of horror at heart. I think his openness is so admirable. And yet again, we have another horror director that is just revered and deeply loved by his community. Wes Craven, same thing, to the 12th degree. That man was like a saint. Tim Burton, same thing. All his actors adore him, but does not handle criticism well. And now another one. I think that what I'm really doing here with this director's series is proving that the horror industry is one of the best in the world. And that has been my real motivation all along. So that will conclude my deep dive. And with that, I say that it's time to rank this man's career. the quality of the work you guys are doing. It's, it's really breathtaking. Thanks for all of that, and I can't wait to see this one. Okay, there are 11 movies and TV shows to rank from the official era of Mike Flanagan's career. Generally, I do include short films, but I kind of wish that I hadn't done that in the past because now I just don't feel like it's fair to stack up such amateur work to big budget Netflix TV shows and stuff like that. So starting at the bottom, number 11, we have Gerald's Game. Fun story, I tried to watch this movie back in probably like 2019 or so, and I was so disturbed by it that I couldn't finish it. And now I sort of wish that I left it that way. This movie was fine, even good up to a point, until I started to feel like it was being way too derivative of Hush, which now I realize is totally intentional. But I was watching it like, eh, I've seen this before. And then when the last 10 minutes played out, ooh, mama. The ending of this movie is so garbage. I don't know what the hell is going on. But even at its very worst, there are still so many redeeming qualities about this movie. The performances from all his regulars slap. There is horror that is genuinely very unsettling and sometimes really relatable. And in true form, it's very character driven. In, but even with all of that, it's still a two and a half star movie for me. The ending just, it really kills it. And if I'm gonna watch something with this sort of concept in it, let's say, then I would rather watch Hush. Moving on up, we have Absentia at number 10. For a first time feature, this is an excellent film. Like I said, there is no doubt how good of a grasp he had on character, even this early on in his career. Ugh. Uh, <coughs> Ooh. Mama. However, it is still definitely a first time feature. It goes from being something really original and unique, but technically it's not always the easiest movie to watch. A fun fact that I didn't mention, one of the leads in this movie, Katie Parker, plays Silent Sari in Doctor Sleep, but I don't think she has any lines. I also didn't mention that Mike's brother plays Diesel Doug in Doctor Sleep. They're part of the True Not clan. Mike Flanagan actually sort of has a bit of a Ted and Sam Raimi vibe going on with his brother. Anyway, I do think this movie is worth watching despite me giving it the same score as Gerald's game. It's interesting to see where he started and I've really never seen anything quite like it, but it might just be a one-time watch for you. At number nine, we have Before I Wake, which I'm not sure if that's deserved. The jury is still out on that. This isn't necessarily a movie that I like, but I also don't have that many complaints about it. When I meet a movie like this, I give it a three out of five. It gets the job done. I see what they were going for. It was communicated. Did it make me feel anything though? Did it make me feel the way that they wanted it to make me feel? No. I also think it deserves some credit though for being a pretty original premise. It's sort of like turning A Nightmare on Elm Street inside out. And rather than it all being horror, they kind of depict the beauty of it as well. And of course there's the emotional tie-in. It's one of his earliest movies, so he still hadn't quite figured out how to pack a really emotional punch. Granted, Oculus came before that, but I wouldn't say that the emotions of Oculus are the strong suit. I think it's just a really good story. All the puzzle pieces were there in Before I Wake, but it just wasn't quite fluid yet. Again, it's pretty unique though. 
I had never really seen a concept quite like this, only with a loose comparison to A Nightmare on Elm Street, and I'd never seen a villain like that either. A pretty unique villain. It's just missing the ingredient of emotion for me, for whatever reason. So moving on to number eight, which is The Haunting of Bly Manor, and it's kind of the same thing for me. This was such a flop after The Haunting of Hill House, in my opinion. I didn't feel like rewatching it for this ranking either. It didn't feel worth it. The only reason why it's ranked a few notches above those other three movies is because of the actors involved and the talent that they always bring to screen. Like, everyone is acting their ass off in a movie that meanders more than a toddler in a Target, okay? I also remember being really disappointed because after the horrors of Hill House, this just wasn't scary in the slightest. It's a drama through and through with, I think, like two jump scares. And the atmosphere was a lot more depressing than spooky. It didn't have the same brilliant, really suspenseful buildup as Hill House. It was totally kind of all over the place. So by the ending, I was like, I literally don't care. Sometimes a movie can definitely coast on performances alone. I don't feel like a TV show can accomplish that same thing, especially when there is no emotional catharsis. But I can't deny the talent of the show. This was about the time when everyone was realizing how amazing Victoria Pedretti is, and thank God for that. There was a lot about it that intrigued me, but there was just a painful lack of follow through. Okay, on to number seven, we have Ouija Origin of Evil. We're right in the middle here. I really enjoy this movie up to a point. I think this is just the universal complaint of the movie, but the ending is so bad. No spoilers, don't worry, but up until a point, I was so invested in these characters. The aesthetics are gorgeous. It's a Flanagan take on the 60s. The characters and the acting are really intriguing. I love Annalise Basso, who came back from Oculus. But then in the last 15 to 20 minutes, maybe even the last act, the movie takes this really generic turn. And it really bums me out because also all of the scares turn into these super generic retreads of things that we've seen in the past. There are huge exposition dumps from characters that randomly come in. It's weird. So again, no emotional payoff when this time I was actually really invested. But regardless, it's still a movie that I enjoy revisiting because if nothing else, it has good vibes and sometimes that's all I want. Also, can we give some claps for Elizabeth Reeser? Rob and Kristen are the big stars from Twilight that get all the praise from breaking out of that bubble, but what about her? She is consistently employed and delivering amazing performances, especially for Mike Flanagan. So I just, I think she deserves a little bit of love, okay? Moving on to number six, we have The Midnight Club, which is kind of on shaky grounds, could kind of go down, maybe up from there. I absolutely adored the format of this show. I also love the characters. I think they all went through really interesting arcs. However, I thought the show peaked at episode two and then it never delivered in the same way again. I even tweeted about it at the time. I was like, oh, they're not fucking around. I'm at episode two and it's amazing. Watch the show. Now knowing that Flanagan only directed the first two episodes, I'm like, oh. But I do think that the problem was more with the writing than anything else. I'm not blaming the other directors because I didn't even notice like aesthetically and everything else, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that it was different directors the rest of the season. I still cared for the characters though, even though this was kind of a weird meandering season. So there was definitely more emotional payoff for me here, especially considering how heavy the subject matter was compared to all the stuff that's ranked below it. And I don't know if it's because it was geared more towards a teen audience, but it kept stumbling. I found a lot of the main story's horror to be super goofy as well, so I was far more enjoying myself with the anthological stories. And my big biggest problem, which is probably more of a me problem, is the fact that I watched it only like nine months ago and I cannot remember dick about the ending. Like it has fallen out of my brain completely. What I do remember is the impact that each death had and I was definitely experiencing the intended emotions surrounding them. I remember loving Heather Langenkamp in the role and thinking, damn, this is a perfect role for her. And that was before I knew what happened to her son. I was thinking, oh, this is just reminiscent of Dream Warriors. Ruth Cod was the absolute highlight for me though. What a fine. I hope that was a breakout role for her and she's been booked and busy this year, but who knows. Overall, a pretty good watch, but I don't know that I would want to watch it again just because now we know that we're not gonna get the payoff of the second season and it leaves a little bit more open-ended than I would like. I feel like if I watched it again, it would just frustrate me. So are you ready now for my top five Flanagan movies and TV shows? Let's go. At number five, we have Midnight Mass, which is the only thing from his catalog that I really wanted to rewatch that I didn't get to. But I do go back and forth on whether or not I actually want to watch that show? Because it's a tough watch. It really accurately depicts religious fanaticism. I live in the country that it's based on, so I see enough of that against my will on my Twitter timeline, in the news, when they threaten Planned Parenthood. Which, by the way, in the description box of every video, I do have a resource master post of reproductive health care needs. If you're in a state where you no longer have safe access to abortion, for example, then there is still help out there. Check out that link. If that makes you angry and you don't believe that people deserve what is sometimes life-saving care, 
What's crazy is that you're actually going to hell. So anyways, the only reason why this incredible show is not higher up on my list is because I don't really enjoy myself when I watch it. Doesn't mean I can't recognize how fantastic it is. And it probably has the best performances ever delivered in a Mike Flanagan TV show or movie. He also based some of the fanaticism on Mrs. Carmody from The Mist, which was a surprising first time watch for me this year. I can handle that in small doses and be like, yep, that would happen. When it's stretched out in a seven episode format, I'm like, I please get me away from these people. However, when it comes to the sneaky subgenre that this show actually is, I'm like, give me more. You know what I mean? I don't want to say what it is because it's kind of a big reveal in the show, but if you've seen it, you know, it's, it's very unique. The fact that it's also the most personal project that Flanagan has ever worked on, I think that really comes through. The fact that it was also this decade long project started as a book, it has this whole journey. The monologue thing is a bit much at times. I do wish that there were maybe a few less of them, but I can't deny how well they're delivered, Kate Siegel especially. We are the cosmos dreaming of itself. It's simply a dream that I think is my life every time. But I'll forget this. I always do. Carve that on my fucking forehead. Like, wow. This show just contains all the strong suits of Flanagan and then some. Phenomenal acting, character development, allegorical storytelling, a twist on a subgenre too. I highly recommend. Okay, on to number four, which if I may take a, take a sniff into the future here, I would bet this would be at the top of a lot of people's lists for Flanagan, but that would be The Haunting of Hill House. The only reason is because I am a bigger fan of his movie career than his TV career, but I still very much respect it. I did rewatched this for this video and really enjoyed myself. This is probably his most succinct and well-constructed story in terms of character arc. And the fact that we're following seven different characters that all have their own distinct things going on. Yet again, we have adults reckoning with childhood trauma in a non-linear format, which is just like Oculus. I'm, ju I'm just now putting that together. And each character's trauma is so fairly explored next to everyone else's. You know what else I'm putting together is how much Hill House is like the Overlook Hotel. If you recall the 10th episode. Maybe you agree. Beyond that, I don't feel like I have that much to offer about this show that hasn't been said already. The only reason why it's not higher up is because it's a lot less frightening than I remember it being. Like when I watched it this time, I was like, this is just a drama. But the tension throughout it is definitely still felt. And a couple of the jump scares I forgot about. So I nearly pooped my bed a few times. Thank you, Mike Flanagan. I don't know why that was a Southern accent. I'm sorry. Let's just move on to the top three. At number three, we have Hush. This is a very simple movie, so I will be brief. The simplicity is what works, and I think that now, even despite kind of knowing the inaccuracies when it comes to deaf and hard of hearing people, I don't feel like that really affects the suspense in the movie. It's the only home invasion movie I've seen that I've ever really liked, and the deaf yet extremely inventive protagonist is definitely the reason why. And the fact that her cat's name is Bitch, come on, that's cinema. It's also a visceral experience. I would never consider this to be a body horror movie, but whenever there is injury, it is felt. It's definitely better on the first watch, so I really envy those of you that haven't seen it yet. Otherwise, it very well could have been my number one choice, but it does lose a little bit of the value on the rewatch. Moving on to my number two, it's a shocking choice because before now, I wouldn't even have necessarily said that I liked this movie, but Dr. Sleep lives at number two. I actually adore this film. Doing a double feature with The Shining is really the only way to properly watch this movie, I think, at least for me now. I would actually give it a lower star rating than Hill House, Midnight Mass, and Hush, but sometimes you just gotta let your emotions dictate you. It goes along with the fact that Ewan McGregor is one of my favorite actors of all time, definitely a comfort actor for me. Rebecca Ferguson is also such a babe. I love that we get so much more of her in the director's cut. And regardless of if we're talking about the theatrical or director's cut, it would still be at number two. Each has pros and cons, and so I end up rating them equally. I don't really know what it is, if it's my research or just if something finally clicked, but I love The Shining and Dr. Sleep now never really had before. Oh, but I'm wearing my Stanley Hotel shirt, see? So yeah, lots of love, but that leaves just one movie at the top of my ranking list. Oculus, yes, Oculus, a shock probably to you all. See, what I never told you about me is that I am a slut for a non-linear timeline, but only when it's done well. Oculus does it so wonderfully where you never lose track of what's going on because of how well-constructed the characters' arcs are. Each of the main characters have dealt with their childhood trauma in the exact opposite fashion, pretty 
much. So by the time they're reconciling it together, the way the events unfold and how it's not even really a clear answer who's who and what's up and what's down in this situation, it's chilling. It's so ambiguous, but in such a satisfying way, which I feel like is really rare. It gives you just enough answers to leave you wanting more. And maybe I'm on an island out here, but I find this movie to be really underrated. I thought that on this rewatch, I might finally sort of realize that it's not as good as I thought it was when I was 14, but I feel the same way about it every single time that I watch it. Yeah, a lot of the scares have since become conventions, but they weren't conventions at the time, so it's not the movie's fault. And regardless, this movie is really carried, I think, on the performances, and this is a rare case where the child acting is on par with the adults. Without Annalise Basso and Garrett Ryan, forget about it. Forget about it. Yes, I do have some childhood bias, but I'd like to think that if I watched it today for the first time, I would still have the same reaction, because I've watched some of my other favorite childhood horror movies recently, and they were terrible. So there you have it, my deep dive and my ranking of Mike Flanagan's career. Wow. If you made it this far, that's pretty insane. So I would definitely say that you're a member of this coven. I mean, come on. Some people who have taken the extra step for this community are my patrons, and you can probably see their names scrolling on screen now. They keep this channel funded. They basically provide me the time and means to make these gargantuous videos. If you couldn't tell, I am pouring weeks of my life into this single video, which I get to do over and over because of these people. As a thank you, I post a minimum of four bonus videos every single month over on my Patreon. So far, that's included a review of Swallowed, a review of Villains, of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Once more new horror releases come out in theaters and on streaming and whatnot, then the Patreon will be popping. But if that's not for you, then all the rest of my social media is also listed down below. But before you go, let me know your Mike Flanagan ranking, or let me know your top three or just your favorite thing by him. Let me know your thoughts about anything, honestly. Don't be shy. I would especially love to know which horror director you think I should cover next. I'm thinking M. Night Shyamalan, but let me know. More than anything, I just hope that you enjoyed this video and that I catch you in the next one. Bye! It took me two hours and 22 minutes to film.